welcome everyone for this uh, new CIPTA seminar. Uh, so today we are very happy to uh, listen to Eichel or Mayer on the challenge and, and quantification of epistemic uncertainty in machine learning. Uh, without further ado, I now hand over the microphone to Ines so that she can introduce uh, today's speaker. Ines. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, uh, my colleague and, and, and friend, Ike Hewlemeyer. He's a well-known expert in, in foundations on artificial intelligence with a special focus on ML. Uh, well, his contributions are quite uh, significant, including a, a well-known book on preference learning and uh, i have also seen that, that there is a, a, a very recent paper on on the topic of today that has been very celebrated too um Ike, uh, currently leads the chair on artificial intelligence in in and machine learning in the lmu of uh, in munich and uh, also chairs currently the european association of for data science he started his academic uh, career or, or a path in, in Paderborn. He studied there uh, both mathematics and business uh, informatics. And uh, he achieved there the, the, um, the PhD on computer science. After that, he spent uh, as a Marie Curie fellow uh, uh, two years in, in, Fran in France. Uh, he, he closely worked with Didier Dubois and Henri Prat, probably you know so, both of them, uh, who are also members of this society. And uh, well, he became a little French, I think, when he was there, and he keeps this, this little touch, French touch, I think, uh, which is nice for me. Um, he he served then as associate and full professor in, in different institutions. He be, came back to Paderborn, and then he moved to Munich. Uh, he has chaired many PC committees of different conferences on AI, ML, uh, data analysis, many things. And he's also a member of very well-known uh, journals like uh, in machine learning like the journal Machine Learning, AI Review, GM, JMLR, well, many of them, including iJAR, who many of you know because you collaborate with it too. He was also a former editor, co-editor-in-chief of Fuzzy Sets and Systems, even if he was not a true believer in Fuzzy Sets, probably. <laughs> but uh, this is not true. <laughs> no, well, he, he, I think he likes more the epistemic perspective than others. I would say, that yeah. might... mm -hmm. well, you can, you can uh, tell us whatever, uh -huh. maybe it is related to your talk. And, um, well, anyway, you can find uh, a lot of information about him in online because while well, many institutions have invited him as plenary speaker and they, they have posted information about him. Um, what I, very much like of Ike is his deep knowledge on, on different topics in, in machine learning. And uh, in this era where all the people rush to publish something new, his ability to, to guide the work of, of people with depth uh, as he does is very valuable for me. And he's currently constantly learning new things and uh, connecting things from different uh, areas. Okay, and uh, he's very strong in mathematics, so his uh, papers are written with much rigor. Something that, that I pretty much like because it is much easier for me to read when <laughs> it's written like that. And. Uh, but the thing that for me is most astounding of him is his ability to explain complex things, making them easy to understand. And I hope you, you enjoy this talk because I'm completely sure that this will be the case today. He's an inspiration in this regard to, to many of us. So Aiki, this is my pleasure to, to give you the floor. So when you hey. want... Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Ines. That was a really kind uh, introduction and very personal. 
Um, you put me a little bit under pressure now <laughs> when you say uh, I explain well and so on. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, I'll do my best. So I also wanted to, uh, <clears throat> of course, also thank the other uh, people, the organizers. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to talk to the SIPTA audience, yeah, which uh, I actually, I think I never did uh, so far. I hope my topic will uh, be of interest. So uh, it's, I would say, maybe not at the core of imprecise probabilities, but especially the later part. Um, I think it's closely connected. Uh, plus, this uh, topic of uh, epistemic uncertainty I'm going to speak about today, I think, should be of general interest. Uh, to uh, people from that community. And I also believe, and I will make this point again more towards the end, that uh, the uh, this uh, field um, has the potential to contribute a lot, actually, to, um, to this topic and uh, maybe to tackle problems which I would consider to be still open uh, within the field of machine learning these days. And it's also interesting to see that so far, um, imprecise probabilities, I would say, have not been used so much in machine learning. There are only a couple or a handful of people, I would say, uh, being familiar both with core machine learning and also creedal sets, imprecise probabilities and these things. But uh, it's uh, I have the feeling a little bit that this is um, going to become much better now. And... Uh, at the course, at the at the root, uh, I would say is also is exactly this topic I'm going to speak about today. All right. So um, the work I'm the 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 work I'm going to present today is joint work with a couple of uh, people I listed here: Victor Banks, Paul Hoffmann, uh, Mira Jürgens, Nies Meinert, Yusuf Saale, and Wilhelm uh, Wachemann. So uh, thanks to them. All right. So. Uh, what is um, the <clears throat> what is the topic actually about? And uh, let me start with a brief uh, motivation. You know, machine learning is applied to uh, many domains these days to various types of problems. And uh, if machine learning is used in a specific domain, especially in safety critical domains, of course, we would like a machine learning uh, method not only to deliver accurate predictions, but also be, in a sense, what we would call uncertainty aware, aware of its own uncertainty, like human experts are, um, medical doctors, for example, who basically notice situations in which they are not certain enough, in which they, they can't make an, a decision in a really informed way. And then do something about it, collect more information, refuse maybe to make uh, the decision and so on. And this is, of course, very important. Um, machine learning methods, uh, especially modern deep learning uh, approaches and so on, are extremely powerful and successful in many domains, yet they still have trouble with this notion of uncertainty awareness, uh, I would say. Here you see a simple example where uh, we trained, uh, on actually not we, uh, other people did, uh, trained a state-of-the-art neural network uh, to classify objects on images. And here uh, for the left uh, image, uh, the network predicts umbrella. For the right image, it predicts a skirt, which obviously is completely wrong. Um, this can happen. Okay, if a human would not make this mistake, maybe other mistakes. Anyway, mistakes can happen, but the problem is the network is not only wrong, it's wrong with high confidence. So uh, it is very confident, almost certain, 97% uh, that this is an umbrella, although it's completely wrong. It's also very certain that this is a skirt, although it's completely wrong. So this example, at least this example, uh, it's hand-picked, of course, but clearly shows that this uh, uncertainty awareness is not always guaranteed. Here it's maybe not so problematic, but imagine you apply such a neural network for medical diagnosis or so, yeah? So then it's much more uh, troublesome. Um, <clears throat> we can 
distinguish different levels of uncertainty awareness of a machine learning method, which I tried to illustrate here, um, using a three class classification problem, because you can uh, nicely visualize uh, what you see here is uh, simply the two simplex, where um, the learner predicts um, one of three possible outcomes, uh, which, uh, you know, today starts the the uh, European Championships, uh, which could be, for example, the outcome of a football match, whether it's a win, a loss, or a tie uh, for the home team, let's say. So then um, um, every point in this uh, barycentric coordinate uh, system here is, is one probability distribution on these uh, three possible outcomes. Uh, a deterministic predictor you see here on the right would only predict one of the corner points. This is obviously the least uncertainty aware predictor you can think of. Yeah, it pretends yeah, uh, that there is a kind of deterministic uh, dependency between uh, the instance to be classified and the outcome, which uh, obviously is most often not the case. And in the case of uh, football, it's definitely not the case. You cannot deterministically predict the outcome of a football match. Um, state of the art, I would say, is the middle case, um, which I call here a probabilistic predictor. It assigns a probability distribution to uh, the instance, a football match in our example, for instance. And our assumption here is that there is a ground truth probability distribution, might be the green point here, um, which is already an assumption, of course, uh, but this is our assumption. There is a ground truth probability, and the learner predicts this probability, for example, with this red point, the red distribution. And it's clear that uh, the learner will probably never exactly hit the right ground truth distribution. And uh, there is a certain yeah, uncertainty about the right probabilistic prediction. This is why we could think of allowing the learner to go beyond predicting a single probability distribution uh, and to predict some sort of second order thing. Uh, for example, a second order probability distribution or um, a creedal set, for example, which uh, characterizes the learner's uncertainty about the ground truth probability distribution and hopefully is guaranteed, at least to some extent, to cover the ground truth with um, high probability. So it's a kind of reliable prediction. Um, this allows the learner to express what I later will call epistemic uncertainty. Um, in the worst case, the learner knows nothing and will predict the whole simplex. Yeah. Uh, in the more informed case, the, if the learner is a football expert, yeah, uh, it will be able maybe to make a more precise prediction. And the important distinction, uh, the important, let's say, uh, difference between the middle and the right uh, case is that this uncertainty here is reducible. This uncertainty is the reducible part of the uncertainty. If the learner uh, gets more information, then it might be able maybe to make a more precise prediction. Whereas this uncertainty, as I said, we assume the ground truth is a probability distribution. By definition, you can't really get rid of. And this is my, not only my, I mean, this is nowadays a common definition, at least in machine learning, this distinction between aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. Aleatoric uncertainty refers to the data generating process. It's a property of the data generating process and refers to the notion of randomness, uh, the uh, variability in the outcome, which is due to inherently random effects. And as such, it is irreducible. Epistemic uncertainty on the other side refers to uncertainty, which is caused by a lack of knowledge of uh, the learner in our case, the machine learning algorithm. Um, and it refers to the epistemic state of this agent. If you want to call it like this, again, in our case, it's a learning algorithm, and it can be in principle reduced on the basis of additional information. 
And this distinction uh, clearly also plays a role in machine learning. Um, so uh, when a, a learner makes a prediction, for instance, uh, let's take this example, simple one-dimensional uh, instance space. If the learner has to predict here and has only seen a few examples, which are rather far away, it might be uncertain whether this is, for example, a positive or a negative case. And you could say that uh, the uncertainty is largely of epistemic nature because yeah, it, it is simply lacking knowledge uh, how the uh, data is distributed in that region here. Um, on, on the right side, the learner will also be uncertain about the prediction, but here uh, the reason is somehow different. Here is a case where the learner has seen lots of data and actually knows that uh, this point here is hard to predict because the two classes overlap in this region. So we could say that this is more uh, aleatoric uncertainty. However, one has to be very careful because this distinction, what is reducible and what is non-reducible, of course, always depends on your setting. And uh, in particular, on the additional information that the learner may have access to. If, for example, the learner can not only add new data points, but may also add new features and uh, embed the data in a higher dimensional space, then the two distributions may unfold in that space and uh, the uncertainty may uh, be reduced. Yeah, or In this case, we would say that this is reducible uncertainty. Yeah, So one has to be a little bit uh, careful here, what is um, aleatoric and what is epistemic really depends on how you specify your setting. Um, it also depends um, the amount of uncertainty, of course, which is also intuitively somehow clear, depends on um, what underlying model assumptions the learner starts with. So what basically the learner knows in the beginning uh, before it observes data and uh, fits a model. So here, for example, uh, you, um, um, you or the learner will be relatively certain that this is a positive point, although it has seen only little data. If it makes the assumption or knows for some reason that the two classes can be separated by a simple linear model, because basically all models which are compatible with the data will tell you this is a positive point. Whereas if the learner makes only weaker assumptions and considers also um, nonlinear discriminant functions as possible candidates, it will be much more uncertain because now there are some plausible models to, uh, saying this is positive and other plausible models saying this is a negative point. Uh, so the uncertainty not only depends on the data, but also on the uh, assumptions that the learner um, starts with. So in, uh, in the standard setting uh, of uh, supervised learning, um, we um, are mainly interested in a predictive uncertainty, meaning the uncertainty that the learner has in making a prediction. There might be, of course, various other uncertainties you could look at, but this is what I'm going to focus on uh, during this presentation here. Um, I said already, we are normally not um, completely fine with uh, deterministic predictions, which do not represent any un uncertainty at all. And we would also perhaps go uh, like to go beyond a, prob a standard probabilistic prediction. So a single probability distribution P or P hat, which is a guess of um, of the ground truth distribution. Instead, we may want a kind of second order um, prediction, capital Q, which comes from a learner, which I denote here by a capital H, um, making clear that this is a learner which delivers us such a second order uh, prediction, Yeah, which comes from some uh, prediction space, which might be, as I said, these are the two um, most important instantiations, let's say, uh, second order distributions and uh, creedal sets, which hopefully are able to adequately 
represent uh, the learner's epistemic uncertainty about its own uh, prediction. Yeah, so uh, here you see this again uh, shown in a graphical way. Uh, at the lowest level, we have a deterministic predictor, which in the case of binary classification for illustration here, uh, just says positive, negative. Uh, then in the middle, we have the probabilistic predictor, which delivers us a probability distribution. So this unit interval here corresponds to the uh, one simplex. <laughs> In the binary case, uh, every probability distribution is a point uh, in this interval. And uh, a second order predictor <clears throat> would could be, for example, a predictor which gives us a probability distribution on probability distributions, this capital Q, yeah, which uh, is then able to represent the learner's epistemic uncertainty. One way to go, uh, I mean, one way to obtain such uh, second order distributions is, of course, the standard Bayesian way. Uh, you can do Bayesian learning. A Bayesian learner um, maintains its belief in the form of a probability distribution over the entire hypothesis space, turns this, this prior distribution into a posterior distribution uh, given the data D it has seen. And then uh, this distribution, when it has to make a prediction for a query instance X, translates into the um, posterior predictive distribution, uh, which is then exactly this type of second order prediction we are looking for um, if we make the assumption that every um, element of this hypothesis space here is a probabilistic predictor. Um, and uh, from this, if uh, from this second order distribution, if you want, you can also obtain a first order distribution p hat by model averaging. Mm. But it's of course more interesting to look at the second order distribution because it gives us also information about how certain or uncertain the Bayesian learner is, roughly speaking, the more peaked that distribution, the more um, the more certain uh, the learner is about the prediction it makes at this first level, which I call the aleatoric level here. The second level I call the uh, epistemic level. Okay, so the, ba the Bayesian approach is one possible uh, way to go, so to say. However, you also know doing Bayesian inference proper is, is not an easy task. Uh, it's computationally intense and uh, so on and so on. So not everyone is so fond of this Bayesian approach. And this is why uh, people recently also uh, looked at other way, uh, other uh, possible approaches. And in particular, uh, in particular, um, one proposal that has been made and which has attracted quite some attention in machine learning recently is the idea to, um, to, to take a shortcut, so to say, and predict uh, second order distributions more directly, right away, so to say. Uh, this goes especially in machine learning under this notion of evidential deep learning. So um, you can imagine, for instance, uh, you train a neural network, let's say, which takes as an example uh, an object to be uh, classified, like an X-ray image, for example, um, which um, needs to be classified as positive or negative. And what the <clears throat> neural network outputs is not just the probability of positive and a probability of negative, but a second order distribution, which might be, for instance, um, the uh, represented by the parameters of a Dirichlet distribution. Yeah, you see here some examples. If the learner knows nothing, it may output 1, 1, which corresponds to the uniform Dirichlet. And uh, the higher these uh, parameters, alpha 1, alpha 2, um, the more peaked uh, the Dirichlet distribution becomes. So the, the more, the less epistemic uncertainty the learner expresses. Um, and in this way, 
uh, the learner in in theory at least is able to uh, directly predict such a second order distribution now the question is of course um, how can we how can we train how can we uh, train such a neural network how can we train such a second order predictor now let me uh, formalize the problem um, in a little bit uh, more yeah formal way suppose we are give we are given training data which is standard training data in the form of tuples x i y i x i take the example you've seen before might be an image and y i might be the class label positive negative standard machine learning training data then the question is can we train a second order predictor which is such a capital h mapping from the instance space to in our case uh, second order distributions so probability distributions over probability distributions doing let's say st going the standard machine learning uh, way and doing just empirical risk minimization or a variant of empirical risk minimization meaning you uh, the learner minimizes a loss which i call le here and the e stands for epistemic i call this an epistemic loss function which compares second order predictions that the learner makes on the training data points with the observed outcomes yi yeah in such a way yeah using a, a suitable second order or epistemic loss function which exactly compares second order predictions with observed outcomes such that the predictor represents its epistemic uncertainty in a faithful way whatever that means yeah at least in a meaningful way i will come back to uh, this in a minute and give you a more uh, precise definition of what i actually mean by faithful here now um, this problem uh, and the hope at least let's say the hope that this may work has a good motivation at least it has a good motivation although you will see later on and this is uh, one interesting result we recently obtained it actually doesn't work but there looking at this problem there there is at least hope that it should work and why um the reason is simply that it works for first level predictions so the aleatoric case um in the uh, a first level predictor um, just outputs a predicted probability p hat yeah given a query instance x uh, as an input yeah this is the the standard case so to say and we know from theory that you can properly train such a first order predictor so that it at least theoretically uh, learns to predict the ground truth probabilities so if we do standard empirical risk minimization using a loss function which i call la here where the a stands for aleatoric which um, compares first order probabilistic predictions uh, g of xi with observed outcomes label class labels positive negative for example um taking as a loss function what is called in the literature a strictly proper scoring rule then uh, we exactly do the right thing namely we incentivize the learner to predict the ground truth probabilities p of y given x um, <clears throat> A strictly proper scoring rule by definition is uh, such a loss function which compares probabilistic predictions with uh, observed outcomes um, and has the property that uh, the, um, the the minimizer of uh, this loss is unique and exactly coincides with a, a true probability p so if the learner knows that um, outcomes y are sampled according to a certain probability distribution p then it it uh, and it wants to uh, minimize its average loss 
in expectation, it knows it has to predict the ground truth probability P. Examples of such uh, strictly proper scoring rules include the uh, cross entropy and the Breyer score, which are, I think, also well known in the in the literature. Now, uh, coming back to our second order problem, the question is now: Can we um, can we find can we define an epistemic loss function Le, which is also incentivizing the learner in a good way, so to say, incentivizing the learner to predict um, a faithful representation of its epistemic uncertainty. Um, this has been considered quite a lot in the recent machine learning literature. One type of um, epistemic loss function that um, authors have, different authors have proposed is of this form. You um, define the loss, you assign to a prediction capital Q, second order distribution, um, a loss which um, is given by the expected loss uh, of an aleatoric loss LA. If you sample the um, first order distribution P according to the second order distribution Q. So in other words, the epistemic loss is just the expectation of the aleatoric loss. Mm, taking any aleatoric loss you want, mm, preferably, of course, a strictly proper scoring rule. Plus, um, a regularized version of this uh, type of loss has been proposed where you take this part here again, but you add now lambda regularization constant times a uh, kind of penalty term, which uh, penalizes deviation from a reference distribution Q0, which is normally taken as the uniform distribution. Yeah. This looks like a minor detail, but it's actually quite important. I will come back to this in a minute. So if you define your epistemic loss in this way, then your empirical uh, risk minimization problem just comes down to minimizing uh, this empirical risk uh, of a predictor capital H, meaning the sum of the epistemic losses that the learner makes uh, on the entire training data set. Uh, this is the empirical risk of a second order predictor. Okay, so now what do we mean by uh, faithfulness of a second order predictor. Um, it's uh, not so easy to say actually what is a, a good or correct uh, second order prediction and what is a incorrect or wrong one. This is clearly not possible. There is no ground truth um, second order prediction representing the learner's epistemic uncertainty in the right way, but what we at least would like uh, to see, of course, is that in the beginning, when the learner has seen only little data, the epistemic uncertainty is high. So for example, the learner in the beginning predicts the uniform distribution or close to the uniform. And then um, as the size of the data set increases, the uh, training data increases, the learner gets more and more um, certain. The, um, predicted second order distribution gets more and more peaked and in the end ideally converges toward a Dirac uh, distribution which is puts all probability mass on the ground truth first order distribution. Now we uh, proposed um, uh, an extension of uh, this notion of a proper scoring rule, um, namely a proper second order scoring rule. And you see the definition here. We say that um, uh, we say that uh, a loss, uh, a second order loss Le, which satisfies some technical properties we need, and not so important uh, now, is a proper second order scoring rule if uh, this inequality here holds for all uh, Q and uh, Q hat. Uh, second order distributions Q and Q hat, which basically says that 
Um, and it's more or less a direct, let's say, extension of the underlying principle of a standard first order uh, scoring rule, which basically says that if the learner holds a certain second order belief Q and uh, the learner is uh, the learner's predictions are penalized um, according to our epistemic loss LE, then the learner should report Q hat equal to Q as the expected loss minimizing prediction. So in other words, if the learner holds this uh, second order belief Q, the loss function also incentivizes the learner to predict the Q and nothing else. Yeah. So, so to make an honest, uh, so to say, prediction, to say what it really believes. Uh, this is what we understand by a second proper a second order scoring rule. And uh, what we could uh, show uh, in a in a recent paper is that there exists actually no such a second order loss function LE, which is proper in this sense, which is really a proper second order scoring rule. So you cannot, apparently, you cannot lift this notion of a, a proper scoring rule from the first level to the second level. This is at least what, what our current results uh, suggest. And uh, here is another interesting result we recently obtained. Um, basically, it's a paper from an ICML paper from this year, um, where we uh, more specifically showed uh, the following. If uh, our aleatoric loss LA is uh, a loss function uh, which is convex in its first argument, which basically holds for all common um, loss functions. And uh, the second order hypothesis space uh, is, let's say, rich enough, formally has a universal approximation property, which is basically true if you train with neural networks, for example. Then the minimizer of our uh, empirical risk, you remember this um, empirical second order uh, risk in the um, in the uh, unregularized case uh, where the regularization constant lambda is equal to zero is a second order predictor H which is of this form this is a second order predictor which uh, only predicts uh, Dirac distributions so uh, which um, only predicts uh, the Dirac delta function. That means the learner uh, always pretends to be completely epistemically certain, yeah, which predicts only, so to say, a single probability distribution, or in other words, which reduces to a first order predictor. Yeah, it pre pretends to be totally epistemically certain, which is actually, of course, not what we what we want to see. And um, um, and if you want to deviate from this behavior of this, this is basically totally overconfident second order predictor, you can achieve this by uh, making the regularization strictly positive. Um, but then uh, the representation of the learner's epistemic uncertainty is basically only controlled by the regularizer, which really looks a little bit arbitrary. So the more you regularize, the more uh, epistemic uncertainty the learner pretends to have. But you have you control it, so to say. Yeah? Um, it's not coming from the learner <laughs> itself, in a sense. OK, um, just uh, I wanted to shortly mention that um, we also studied other types of extensions um, of um, or related extensions where this uh, expectation here um, is not uh, taken outside the aleatoric loss but inside the aleatoric loss which uh, um, i see the time is running so uh, i will not uh, detail here but which leads to similar problems uh, of non-identifiability non-uniqueness um, of uh, the empirical risk minimizer and so on. So this is all looking a little bit uh, troublesome from a theoretical perspective, although 
people sometimes report uh, good empirical results on specific types of problems. But uh, yeah, theoretically, this all looks a little bit uh, debatable, so to say, which I find is an interesting um, yeah, result. Also telling us something, this is why I called <laughs> uh, my presentation today here challenges, uh, which uh, basically also is telling us something about the difficulty of the problem of uh, capturing epistemic uncertainty in a meaningful way. Okay, so... Um, now my final part is a short is a shorter part. Uh, I, I won't take uh, much time here, um, which is about uncertainty quantification. I just wanted to make a couple of comments um, on this topic because uh, I think it might be also interesting for people here. Um, so what I mean by uncertainty quantification is actually measuring uh, the amount of um, uncertainty whether aleatoric or epistemic or even total uncertainty, um, basically yeah, combining both aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty in terms of a single number, which is often very useful. It's a measure of uncertainty. So how uncertain is the learner? In machine learning, this is useful for various things in active learning, for example, or to decide uh, whether the learner should reject or not, and so on. So basically, we would like to have numbers like here. Yeah, the learner makes a second order prediction Q, and it's it 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 can tell you um, I am totally uncertain to the degree 0.6, and uh, the aleatoric part is 0.2, and uh, the epistemic part is 0.4, for instance. Yeah, and uh, you see from this example already, ideally, uh, we would like to have uh, numbers such that total, uh, total uncertainty decomposes additively into aleatoric and epistemic uncertainty. Yeah? This is what many people want to have, at least, although this is a little bit questionable <laughs> thing, as you will see. Um, when working with uh, second order um, predictions, uh, second order probability distributions, Currently, I would say the standard approach in machine learning is to uh, measure, um, is to um, basically, uh, yeah, measure total uncertainty in terms of uh, Shannon entropy, uh, sh which is basically Shannon entropy of, uh, yeah, the average prediction. Um, in the basic case, this would be uh, the probability that you obtain by model averaging and then take advantage of a uh, result from information theory, a well-known result telling you that um, you, can, um, you can represent uh, the entropy as the sum of the conditional entropy and mutual information, um, measuring uh, the aleatoric uncertainty as a conditional entropy, uh, the entropy on the uh, distribution on the outcome Y, given that the learner knows the probability, the first order probability P, which makes sense because if the learner knows the true probability distribution, then basically all epistemic uncertainty is gone. Um, and uh, yeah, define the um, epistemic uncertainty by the difference between the two, which also makes sense. Um, and this is exactly the mutual information um, which also makes sense because, uh, yeah, the difference between uh, the um, uncertainty in the prediction and the uncertainty in the prediction, knowing the ground truth distribution, this is exactly, yeah, the gap, so so to say, the the knowledge gap uh, of 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 the learner. So this somehow does make sense. Nevertheless, uh, we recently criticized this approach for a couple of reasons uh, in a. UA, uh, yeah, it was a UAI paper, I think last year. Um, I don't have the time to uh, go so much into detail here. I just wanted to mention that um, meanwhile, we did not only criticize, but we also made uh, um, alternative approaches. One is based on the notion of distance, uh, specifically the Wasserstein distance. 
And here the idea is to ask uh, basically the question or to measure um, uncertainty uh, in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, how much transport of probability mass you have to invest to turn a second order distribution into a distribution which first has, has no epistemic uncertainty anymore, uh, and then uh, which also has no aleatoric uncertainty anymore. So which lets the learner, so to say, get rid of first its epistemic part of the uncertainty and then also uh, the aleatoric part. And uh, another recent proposal um, is, is a loss-based proposal, which is based uh, on yeah, this notion of proper scoring rule I mentioned before. And this approach essentially makes use of a known result uh, also, which uh, tells you that you can um, that you can decompose um, proper scoring rule phi, or more, uh, more precisely, the expectation of, of phi, into two parts. Uh, the one is uh, a divergence from the ground truth. Let's say if Q is the ground truth and the learner predicts P, then the first part is a divergence part. The second part is an entropy part, the entropy of uh, the ground truth distribution Q which nicely qualifies as an aleatoric uncertainty measure because this is the part you cannot get rid of even if you predict the, the ground truth q you you still have this part which which doesn't go away uh, what you can reduce is the divergence and this nicely qualifies as an epistemic part um yes and and our approach is based on on this uh, idea now, what I very quickly now wanted to uh, touch on is the case where uh, the learner represents its um, second order uncertainty, its epistemic uncertainty, not in terms of a second order distribution, but uh, in the form of a creedal set, yeah, which might be also of interest to some people here. A creedal set is a nice alternative, uh, of course, it also allows you, obviously, to capture both types of uncertainty, aleatoric and epistemic. Um, epistemic, essentially, by the size of the, the creedal set. Sometimes um, other notions are used in the literature, conflict, non-specificity, and so on. Um, one question is, of course, which I cannot address today, how do you actually learn what I would call a creedal predictor, meaning uh, a predictor that produces uh, creedal sets as predictions. Yeah, it's a non-trivial problem. Some proposals have been made in the literature, but it's not so clear. But now let us assume we, we, we are given such a predictor. So we have such a predictor which gives us um, creedal sets as predictions. Then we may ask uh, exactly this quantification question I asked before, how to quantify the total uncertainty represented by a creedal set and how can we uh, disaggregate this uncertainty into an aleatoric and an epistemic part, ideally in an additive way as shown here. This is actually um, not a new problem. Uh, people have looked uh, into this for a long time. People like George Clear, for example, did a lot of work on this question, uh, proposed axiomatic systems, uh, which are telling you what is a good uh, measure of uncertainty and what less. Uh, and we also recently looked into this problem uh, with uh, Sebastian, for example, in this uh, UAI paper um, from a more machine learning perspective. Um, yeah, there are uh, a few uh, let's say, well-founded extensions uh, of uh, measures that have been proposed and which do have nice mathematical properties. So, for example, um, a meaningful extension of um, total uncertainty is the upper entropy, which uh, just uh, looks at the uh, highest um, entropy of all the measures uh, Q inside your creedal set. Um, 
An example of a well-founded uh, measure of epistemic uncertainty is, um, you may know, the generalized Hartley measure, which is a kind of weighted average of the standard Hartley measure assigned to sets, which measures complexity or uncertainty of a set in terms of the log of the cardinality. Uh, the MQ here is the Verbius inverse of the associated um, lower probability measure. And um, <clears throat> an example of uh, an extension of aleatoric uncertainty is the lower entropy, which is just the minimum of the entropies of the distributions inside the creedal sets, although it has um, yeah less nice mathematical properties, but still a meaningful measure. Uh, the problem is that, um, as far as I know, maybe you know better, but there is uh, no really um, definition of three measures for total aleatoric epistemic uncertainty, which all behave, let's say, well, which all have nice mathematical properties and such that we do have this additive decomposition here. Yeah. Um, which personally, by the way, I don't find very surprising because for me, this additive decomposition also doesn't make so much uh, sense um, to somehow enforce it. Um, so then uh, what can we do? I mean, one proposal, I think it uh, came even from George Clear himself, is that we say, okay, maybe we don't need these uh, nice properties for all three measures, perhaps it's enough if two of them have good properties. Uh, let's let's take two and define the third one just in terms of the difference. Yeah. So um, we could, for example, fix total uncertainty as upper entropy and epistemic as generalized hardly, and then uh, define aleatoric in terms of the difference between the two. Yeah. Or you take, for example, upper entropy and lower for aleatoric, and then define epistemic as the difference between the two. Um, yeah, we looked into this uh, also with uh, Sebastian in a critical way and um, also questioned this additive decomposition. The interesting finding we made is, is that uh, theory here ni uh, nicely, uh, or let's say practice nicely um, confirms theory in the sense that if you use these uncertainty measures for specific purposes, machine learning, we often say downstream tasks, you want to solve a certain task, active learning, for example, or a classification with a reject option or so, then um, those measures that are theoretically nice and have good properties also perform empirically better, whereas these difference measures here, which are a little bit debatable theoretically, also show relatively poor performance empirically. Yeah. So this is what we could what we could show. And um, yeah, um, what we uh, now this is really very uh, recent work. Uh, what we also uh, proposed is um, an extension or is a class of family, so to say, of uh, uncertainty measures for creedal sets, which are inspired by this uh, standard approach I mentioned for second order distributions, where basically you say that uh, the epistemic uncertainty is the difference between entropy and conditional entropy. Um, and this can be interpreted as the expected gain of uh, the learner in terms of the log loss redu uh, reduction, the reduction in terms of log loss. Uh, this is simply because the entropy is nothing, the entropy of a distribution P is nothing else than the expected logistic loss uh, of, uh, of, of delivering P as a prediction when the ground truth is indeed P. And this you can nicely generalize to other uh, loss functions, loss functions other than log loss. Um, and um, then for a creedal set uh, Q, say uh, that uh, the epistemic uncertainty is, of course, you cannot average now, but we can look at the maximal gain that is possible uh, for a learner to achieve. So the maximal, the maximal 
uh, DL uh, divergence, where L is any loss function, can be log loss, but can be also another loss function between two distributions, P and P prime, inside the creedal set. Now, this is the L divergence. And uh, likewise, uh, we propose not to specify one um, measure of aleatoric uncertainty, but a lower and an upper bound, uh, simply by the lower and upper value for the associated L entropy, which is the L entropy of the distribution P is uh, the expected um, loss of uh, P Y, where Y is sampled according to P. So basically this corresponds to this second part of um, this decomposition of proper scoring rule that you cannot get rid of. And here you see some examples of some losses which are commonly used in machine learning, log loss, Breyer score, spherical loss, zero one loss, uh, and uh, how the corresponding aleatoric and epistemic uh, uncertainties look like. And uh, yeah, this, uh, this uh, family of measures has good, um, theoretical properties. Uh, since my time is running out, I won't go completely through. Um, we have continuity, we have monotonicity. Yeah, if the creedal set gets larger, what you expect is that your epistemic uncertainty also increases, just like upper aleatoric entropy and upper total entropy. In the case where the creedal set reduces to a singleton set, um, single probability distribution, then the epistemic uncertainty vanishes, uh, also meaningful property, uh, etc. And uh, also, if uh, you instantiate your loss L um, with a proper scoring rule, then you also, you are theoretically on the safe side, uh, all uncertainty measures are non-negative and so on. So all in a sense behaves quite well. And we could also show that um, in first, at least in first experiments, it seems like uh, this um, family of measures is uh, showing quite good performance in different downstream tasks where uh, uncertainty is useful, accuracy rejection curves, for example, um, the setting of out of distribution data that machine learning people uh, nowadays look at a lot and active learning uh, and so on. Okay, so let me quickly wrap up. Um, yeah, I hope uh, I could convince you, but anyway, as an uncertainty community, you are, uh, I guess, open to this kind of <laughs> argument that uh, designing reliable uncertainty aware learners is uh, a very important task these days, but it's also somehow challenging and uh, both conceptually and computationally. Distinguishing between these two types of uncertainty, aleatoric and epistemic, I would say, yes, it is useful. And uh, really, uh, people looked into this quite a lot in the recent past. Um, however, it seems to be hard to tackle. And this is also why I chose the title of this talk. So in particular, we recently obtained uh, some which I personally find interesting negative results showing that at least this approach of direct uh, epistemic uncertainty prediction called evidential deep learning uh, also uh, via minimizing the second order, second order loss function is uh, theoretically not really sound. Yeah? And uh, in a sense, uh, epistemic uncertainty here is injected in a relatively arbitrary way. It's implicitly controlled through this regularization constant, which is a little bit um, questionable. So the one very interesting general question, I think, is, uh, yeah, how can you represent, uh, how can you make your learner represent uh, its epistemic uncertainty in a somewhat, somewhat objective way? And is this possible at all? I mean, in a sense, it is very clear that the prior knowledge of the learner is needed, and it certainly has an influence on its epistemic uncertainty. This is made very, very clear in the Bayesian approach, yeah, where the learner really starts with a prior and makes very explicit uh, what it knows in the beginning. 
In the other approaches that have been proposed as alternatives so far, this is less clear. It seems that this, yeah, there is always some sort of uh, mm, assumption that biases the epistemic uncertainty quantification, but it's not made that explicit. But somehow it seems you cannot really get around this, which might be, after all, not so surprising. And um, yeah, another very interesting question for me now, and also maybe hopefully for some of you, uh, is the question, what role can uh, imprecise probability and creedal sets play into this whole endeavor? Um, and how could um, creedal sets, for example, help to uh, solve uh, some of the open problems that we still have in um, yeah, training uh, epistemic uh, uncertainty aware uh, machine learning uh, methods? Okay. So this is all from my side. I hope I'm still somewhat in line. And I thank you very much for your attention. And of course, I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much.